Hello, everyone, and welcome to our ProcureCon webinar for today. Practically speaking, why IT and procurement should talk about digital transformation. Now, before we dive into today's webcast, I wanted to bring your attention to the console in front of you. While I have your attention, uh, the windows or widgets, as we like to call them on the back end, that are laid out on your screen are 100% customizable, meaning you can feel free to move them around, maximize them, minimize them, reposition them to fit whatever device you're using to connect with us today. And one of those buttons on the very bottom of your download bar uh, shows that we have some goodies loaded up in this portal called the Resource Center. Now, we have uh, two PDFs that are available for direct downloading. They're for our ProcureCon IT sourcing event that's coming up in June. They are the agenda for 2018 as well as the attendee list for 2018. And when I say direct downloading, I mean that there's no forms, no fuss. Direct download to your inbox. Uh, so as I mentioned, the ProcureCon IT sourcing event is coming up in June. And if you haven't bought your ticket yet, then you are definitely in luck. Uh, so for joining today's webinar, we've made sure to slot in a 20% off discount code for you. Uh, so if you click on that banner on your screen, uh, sign up and uh, register today to, to make sure you, you grab that discount code and apply it. Uh, we're also going to try and save about 10 to 15 minutes or so at the end of the discussion for a Q&A session. So there's a specific portal on your screen uh, literally called the Q&A box. And feel free to submit questions using that specific function um, to send questions to us. So let me move further on into the webcast to tell you who our amazing speakers are. We are joined today by Paul Blake, the Associate Director of ProcureCon Marketing at GEP. Paul, you want to say hi to our audience? Hi, good morning, good afternoon. Hello, everybody. It's a great pleasure to be here today. Thank you, Elise. Excellent. And we're also joined by Santosh Reddy, the Director of Technology Services Organization, also at GEP. Santosh, want to say a few words? Thank you, Elise. Hello, everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, and happy Women's Day to our audience here. Wonderful. So we're very excited to have these two amazing speakers on board for today's webinar. Uh, and I think I've been going on for long enough, so without further ado, let's kick this webinar off. Uh, Paul, the floor is yours. Excellent. Thank you very much, Elise. Um, hello again, uh, again everybody. Um, it is a great pleasure to be here, and particularly as here in New Jersey, uh, anybody else in the Northeast will understand this. We're under uh, quite a pile of snow right now that fell over the, over the course of the last 24 hours, taking out the power, taking down trees. So it's actually a miracle that we're here at all. So we're very grateful for it. Um, hopefully, we've got some great content for you today. Um, hopefully, it will be thought-provoking. Um, feel free to pose any questions that you have throughout the course of uh, the next hour. We'll endeavor to answer as many as we can towards the end. And, and if we can't get to all of them, we will answer them um, offline afterwards. Um, I'm not going to take any time telling you about GEP or about uh, any of our products or services. Um, clearly, you'll have access to the internet if you don't know who we are. Um, we would obviously encourage you to find out, but we're not here to uh, uh, to tell you about anything other than the, the subject in hand, which we feel quite strongly about, which is about the relationship between IT and procurement and how those organizations and indeed others really need to work together, really need to communicate and understand each other's point of view right now um, if we're to move into uh, a, a more productive future. So I'm going to begin with a rather bold statement and say, there is a productivity crisis in the workplace today. We want to achieve more. We want to increase bottom line value, create more savings, get a better handle on risk, but it's hard to actually make any headway. And we're not even talking about achieving more with less here, which is, is, is a sort of current trope. Many organizations are finding it hard to achieve even the same levels of productivity as they used to, and they can't even achieve more with more. In this session, we're going to look at why that might be, what the issue is, and how through creative collaboration, the procurement and IT professionals in our companies can bring about a transformation in productivity in the workplace. So let's start with the problem. In the last couple of decades, clearly we've seen digital technologies coming to the fore in the workplace and achieving a critical mass. In the 1990s, desktop computing became commonplace, and over the course of that decade, began to move off the desktop into the briefcase and then into our pockets. 
Now at the turn of the millennium, significant changes in working practices driven by technology usage has started to drive productivity. And by the end of the last decade, it looked like output was on a pretty straight upward trend. This data we have is from the, the UK's Office of National Statistics, the UK's data uh, division, if you like, the UK government's data division. And they've been tracking output and tracking productivity for many years. And so you would think that we should be somewhere you know, somewhere up around 40% um, uh, higher than we were 20 years ago. Now, one might expect a certain downturn as a result of the financial crash that started about a decade ago, but not perhaps that productivity has essentially flatlined since then. It seems that almost at the time that workplace technologies hit saturation point, productivity growth faltered. Much of that may be due to the slow recovery of the global economic situation and other factors indeed, but I personally believe that there is an important factor at play here about the technology we're using. And perhaps the technology we have been using to date imposes fundamental limits on how effective we can be in the workplace. The first flush of digital technologies had a great positive impact on productivity. There is no doubt about that but perhaps we've reached some kind of limit and getting beyond that will require not just more of the same, but something new. I recently met an executive from an extraordinarily well-known high-tech manufacturer whom I won't name, and he said that the fundamental bottleneck on their ability to deliver new innovative product was the rate at which they could construct new manufacturing facilities and that that rate has been unchanged, he said, for the last 50 years. It is a limiting step it's, it's to such a degree that they have to start building the factories years before they even finish developing the product in order to begin manufacturing the product as soon as the design is ready. So I had to ask him, does that mean that sometimes the factories you have are not actually fit for purpose because your product design has changed? And he said, very often. But what choice do we have? We have to build factories and build into the design of the factories redundancy and additional cable channeling and, and all, all of other facilities on the expectation that they're no longer to be fit for purpose on the day that we open them. So the limitations of our technology, our base level technology, can fundamentally act as a break on growth in productivity, despite having been previously the source of that growth. And today's workplace technology model built around the three pillars of email, documents and standalone applications, I contend fundamentally imposes limits on how efficiently and efficiently. Now this perspective was echoed just a couple of weeks ago in a news article on the BBC News website. And it talked about a report from Microsoft about how today's technology is getting in the way of our being able to do our jobs. Commentating on the report and, and quoted in this article, the splendidly named Sir Kerry Cooper, Professor of Organizational Psychology at Manchester Business School said, technology can overload people and make them less productive because they get caught up in it rather than using it to deliver a service or a product. Productivity comes from creative interchange. It does not come from people sitting in front of machines sending emails. Now, he is, of course, absolutely correct, but how many of us think that we've had a productive morning if by 11 a.m. we've been able to empty the inbox? We're taking the two most productive hours in the day and giving them over to opening email. But I bet nobody here can say that their job is opening emails, but that is what we spend our time doing. And that's not an analogy, that is a, that is a real situation. Here's another graph, here's some real data from my own personal email, email box at GEP. Now, I have to admit, I'm a self-confessed hoarder. I don't delete emails as a rule, ever. 
Of course, I get rid of the junk and the spam, although that's, most of that's thankfully automated now. And I file into folders all the relevant stuff, all the stuff that's important to me that I might need to revisit about things that I'm working on and, and organizations that I'm actively dealing with. The, what's left then is just the sort of background noise, if you like, run-of-the-mill day-to-day inbound traffic. And this is genuinely how it has grown over the five and a half years that I've been with GEP. And I was busy enough when I joined the company back in 2012. Today, I receive close to 45 times the volume of noise email than I did. And the reason for t telling you this is because there is nothing whatsoever that a software company can do to increase my productivity if what I am doing is dealing with email. I cannot read any quicker, I cannot type any quicker, I cannot think any quicker, so my throughput in dealing with emails is precisely exactly the same as it was 20 years ago, and there is nothing any advances in the email tool can do to change that. And it's exactly like that high-tech manufacturer who is limited by the speed at which it takes to build a factory. When we expand that thought into how we deal with, say, a request for proposal, or a contract, if we're still treating them as documents, isolated blocks of information to be typed and sent around as email attachments, then there's nothing that software can do to break us out of that productivity trap that we're in. So to transform, to create completely new levels, a sea change in productivity, we have to start thinking about doing things in a different way. Now, there's a traditional notion that people, process, and technology are three separate silos, each of which can be re-engineered or replaced in isolation. But I think that's plain wrong. The case that I've made is that it is people using software that define and determine the process that is actually followed. And the limitations of the software, as much as its capabilities, fundamentally dictate what we can do, how much we can do, what we can achieve. Now, don't get me wrong, the technology we have has largely driven the growth curve that started two or three decades ago, but I think we're now hamstrung by it. So my contention is that the next uptick in productivity, especially in our area of procurement, will be driven by technological in innovations not so much for what the software can do, but for what it should free us to do. And I think procurement is a perfect proving ground for this notion of a digital workplace, a new way of, of doing business, as so much can be gained by removing those limits to the productivity. Conversely, IT organizations need to understand that upgrading applications does not constitute a transformation in capability. Exactly the same way as getting a new email system doesn't change how much you can do. It's just doing the same thing in a different room. So let me just give you an idea of, of, of procurement and, and how it works in, in the software sense. This is the traditional approach to technology and procurement. We have an end-to-end -end process laid out from source to pay, from opportunity to completion of, of payment of an invoice. And we have typically mapped out our e ideal process as the road to value, and while traveling that road, we make a series of stops along the way and use some software. We start with a bit of planning, perhaps in a spreadsheet, and then we do a bit of sourcing, some negotiations, perhaps in a, in a standalone RFP tool. And then later on, do some purchasing, maybe in an ERP system. And if we're lucky, we've got something that will enable us to do some supplier relationship management. Oh, by the way, contract management, oh, that happens somewhere else entirely. That's a different group of people. That involves lawyers. And there is a completely different system, and it's a dark alleyway that procurement people don't really like to go down necessarily. But this is a model that, however familiar to procurement folks, fails to recognize the reality that software is where we work. There is no path between one tool and the next. We're simply moving from one to the next. And the limitations that are in the software are starting to become obstacles. Like it or not, pretty much all our interactions today with the outside world beyond line of sight are mediated through software. And what that software doesn't allow us to do 
doesn't get done. As for all, the all-important contract in the procurement process, having that offline and managed elsewhere is not so much a rock in the road as a tree completely blocking it. And I promise you I made this slide before a tree fell down and blocked my street last night. So to explain why the contract is so key and why it plays such a central role in the information system around procurement, let's take a look at that process from source to pay. In simple terms, it begins with an investigation of spend history and spend patterns to reveal opportunities for savings for value and productivity improvements based on a range of metrics. That investigation naturally leads to planning and strategies to deliver that value, and then through sourcing and negotiations, those plans are executed to set up the contracts, which, if you like, are the vehicles for delivering the value. With the contracts in place, you can then exploit the negotiation by managing the relationship with the supplier and then purchasing from the contract. So the value results from when the contract is used, not by the procurement folks, but by the rest of the business using that contract. But this can break down. This process can fail if you fail to manage the supplier correctly, and more importantly, if you fail to actually use the contracts. And failure to actually execute and utilize the contracts is the most common reason why savings are never realized. The potential can't be actualized if all the hard work procurement put in to creating the contract isn't exploited by the rest of the business. So the idea we have is that the digital workplace can overcome these obstacles by unifying the process steps into a single digital environment where, each, where the purpose of each step, the intent if you like, can be transferred from one participant to the next, not as a document, not as an email as attachment, but as a piece of business. This idea is predicated on our no longer working in silos created by the software, by software that was designed for a single task. So all of the stakeholders, the sourcing and category managers, the executive level leadership, the day-to-day -day requesters, the suppliers themselves should all be able to conduct business and make decisions more swiftly and efficiently by collaborating in a single digital workplace. This digital workplace is going to be forged from a raft of different technologies, some current, some new, and some yet to gain a foothold, and almost certainly some that we don't even know about yet. Already we're halfway down this list on the left-hand side of the screen here as organizations are starting to get to grips with the idea of a single platform source to pay model and are putting the user, the day-to-day -day user, at the heart of how the process works and the heart of how the software should function. Emerging concepts such as how a fully connected world can interoperate for supply chain and procurement are yet to be fully clarified. But there's no doubt artificial intelligence is going to play a part in this. What role it will play is still being determined, and that will remain in flux for some time. But Whit Andrews from Gartner recently shared some research that they conducted at, at last year's Application Strategies Summit. And it seems that over the last few years, more and more is being said about artificial intelligence on social media and, and in the news and in publications. I'm sure you'll agree. And everybody is talking about cognitive. They're talking about deep learning, machine learning, and all the rest. But where are the products? When will we see mach the machine doing our procurement for us? And this is an area where IT and procurement can and should share ideas and work together. Organizations need to keep a weather eye on these developments. This is not procurement's natural role, of course, but it is IT's. And what IT needs to know is where the challenges and opportunities lie for procurement and supply chain folk, not least because imposing another new technology on the business could simply add more rocks to the road. 
IT should act as a trusted advisor and guide, aware of the needs of not just the operating business, but the procurement organization that keeps the business clothed and fed, as it were. Nevertheless, the application of IT technologies to that source to pay process is already having an impact. The heavy lifting of data analysis, the simplification of catalog searching, the identification of savings opportunities are all areas where machine learning and predictive logic are already in use today. In the future, we'll see a lot more help from software in all these areas, and that's how you should look at it, an augmentation of ability, not a replacement. Replacing humans in the procurement process might be possible in the future, it might but only if we want to stay on the same productivity flatline. Fully automating the process is theoret theoretically possible, but if the process is wrong because it was designed based on fundamental limits set by older technology and older process uh, uh, regimes, then everything needs to change, and that is going to require human ingenuity, flexibility, and human intelligence. This is where we find the inf interface between theory and reality. Technology is never the answer, but it can help to define one. And Santosh, I think you're going to take us through some of the ideas here and, uh, and then start to talk about some of the real world implications. Thank you, Paul. I really like the analogy of your email tool. Changing the tool is not really going to change the way you're reading your emails or increasing your productivity. That was a good analogy. Um, thanks, everyone, for attending today's session, uh, particularly those of you who are braving the weather um, out in the east and attending this. Appreciate your time and effort. Um, Paul went over some of the breakthrough technologies that are coming up in the recent times. With the innovations in just the last three years, we really don't have to look too back but just in the last three years, we have seen some remarkable new technologies coming to the fore. 3D printing, blockchain technologies, space technologies, augmented realities. While some of these new technologies like these space technologies might not have an immediate implication on how we are going to live our day-to-day -day lives, the rest are fairly straightforward in their application and primarily are advantages. But the common theme of within all these innovations are that they are a disruption to what we are doing today. The world was fascinated with the concept of being able to create completely new objects out of seemingly thin air when the 3D printer was first introduced. It started off being expensive, but in no time school kids were creating 3D printers as part of their projects. This talks to show how well connected the world is today, that today's innovation could become tomorrow's commodity, or maybe day after tomorrow. With greater availability of information and the proliferation of internet to hinterland areas of the Asian markets, there are other risks that are rising as well, such as copyright infringement. And there isn't much many companies or the copyright holders can do about this. If you were to look up the example of Stickbox, which happens to be a very creative smartphone case that turns into a monopod or a selfie stick as well, just one week into the Kickstarter project, the product was cloned and was av available on the online markets, leaving the innovator with a lawsuit or potential lawsuit to deal with. With most of us on the move, we probably have more information, personal and official, on the phone than we had on our computers just five years back. And as typical travelers and just trying to live our day-to-day -day lives, what we don't realize is that the hackers are getting smart and with acts such as juice jacking, is it really safe even to do a simple thing such as plugging in our phone to charge it at an airport? When there are such demands on us to be careful within our day-to-day -day personal activities, and there are so many new innovations that companies can take advantage of, are we truly aware of the risks that we are opening up ourselves to? And that's where procurement and IT, the partnership between these two, is going to be 
playing a lot more relevance as we are expo exposing ourselves to a complicated scenario. The recent surge in cryptocurrency prices created quite a bit of interesting conversations on a variety of groups that I'm part of. There are self-proclaimed gurus, self-proclaimed uh, experts at how the markets are going to react and move. But of particular interest is how the banking space has reacted to blockchain, te blockchain technology. Banks are interested in adopting the blockchain technology but not supporting the concept of cryptocurrency. That's my view, that's my take of how the discussions were proceeding. But what's interesting is this. With its concept of distributed ledger, it is touted as being extremely safe. Now, I'm not an expert at blockchain or distributed ledgers. So as a layman, I have to ask, how come such a safe technology is compromised repeatedly? The reason I bring this up is not to express opinion on the technology, but the fact that these technologies are evolving rapidly and a single function within an organization will not be fully equipped to handle the vagaries. These, this requires significant collaboration between IT and procurement to work together and engage with other parts of the organization as they go through a digital transformation. The key is not just to make progress, but also to ensure they're not exposing themselves to new risks that they're unaware of at that point. Procurement has a larger role to play in the new scheme of things, from playing the role of uh, price and quality negotiators to being their experts to at identifying what the company truly needs, making the users the heart of what they're trying to achieve and all the while evaluating the risks and evaluating the suppliers. The procurement also is a beneficiary of the digital transformation and not just the facilitator with all the new procurement tools and AI coming into the place. We are all benefiting from AI in our personal lives without even realizing it. A simple example, your smartphone's home page or lock screen informs you of the weather conditions outside at the location you are in. If you're traveling and you happen to be in a different city, you don't have to mention that to the phone. It just picks up. And you know the mechanics of how it does. What I'd like to call out is that the phone is using its GPS data, feeding it to an application that then looks up the weather periodically and updates your lock screen. Quite likely, it came that way, the phone that you purchased was already set to do those things, and you did not have to take those steps or download any applications to set it up to give you that information. Look back 10 years, you needed to log into a computer and find out that information. Look back 20 years, you had to either tune into a radio service or a weather channel on TV to find out the weather forecast of that day, and quite likely, the weather forecast would be bright and sunny, and you step out, it starts raining. AI is here to stay, and it keeps getting better and better. And we will use it without realizing it. What AI did not do is change what we do. It changed how we do it. Enable us to do things faster, or not do certain things at all, like trying to look up weather. AI can be a powerful enabler when consciously applied. To Paul's point, we are sifting through 45 to 50 times the volume of email, spending more time on them than actual work, but we're still getting the same amount of work. The productivity has flatlined, it did not go down. So in the toolkit of a procurement professionals, AI has a powerful role to play as well. And we can talk of a few examples of how it is relevant monitoring the spend patterns and calling out when purchases are not going to the contracted suppliers, capturing maverick spend from rising, talking about ensuring that there is contract compliance. These are things that can be trusted to AI and not have a conscious eye out or a weather eye out to make sure people are utilizing contracts. Simple application of AI can enable companies automate their workflows, something that has been happening for decades now but with, we have now new opportunities to take them to a whole new level through digital transformation. Monitors, monitoring supplier risks is another very good example of AI application. 
When the Fukushima disaster in Japan happened on Friday, March 11th, a life sciences company in Europe, which was at, in the future uh, was going to be my client at that point, had put in motion plans to move their sources of supply to other parts of the world to ensure business continuity. What I learned later was that it was a sudden abrupt activity that led to frantic work over the weekend and the next few weeks after. AI can be an enabler to simplify things or prevent them from happening. Most procurement professionals would already be aware of this if they have dealt with the air travel or their travel management company programs. Most air travel service providers or travel management companies have simple tools at their disposal that raise red flags when more than a certain number of individuals from the same company or on the same flight or are commuti commuting out from the same airport within a short duration. Then can't AI monitor and prevent organizations doing something similar with their suppliers? And why monitor supplier risk when they are dependent on their own suppliers individually? If you are in manufacturing and this has been an established and proven practice to be monitoring the second and the third tier suppliers as well. But for those who have done this, you would realize that it's an extremely time consuming and painstaking activity. That's where AI can help automate and be that weather monitor for you, letting you do other things like building the supplier relationship. Paul? Excellent. Thank you, Santosh. I mean, that, that is really key, everybody. The idea that what these emerging technologies can do, particularly artificial intelligence and to a certain extent robotic automation, is to simplify our interaction with the information sources and with the systems um, that, that, are, that are already out there um, to enable us to get more done, to get a, a, an upturn in productivity. So the notion of an intelligent digital workplace, as I said, is to simplify the interaction uh, and perhaps do that through a single conversational interface conversational type interface, and I, that stands to be one of the biggest influences on productivity, one of the biggest disruptors as to how we work. It might seem utterly alien to imagine that we might conduct the entire strategic procurement process through simple conversational interactions, but prior to the 1990s, uh, sorry, the 1980s, and before we started to get locked into an, an email document application way of working and thinking, that's precisely how it was done. The technology came along to help us do a better job, and it did so very much, no question about that. We just have to look at the productivity curve. But now that we've reached a limit on that, new technology stands ready to do a better job. We just need to synthesize it, integrate it together into this digital workplace and taking into account the risks of the emerging technologies that Santosh has elucidated. But our behavior needs to change too. Um, and I, I heard the, the benefits of this kind of approach uh, um, summed up very well at, at, at another conference last year. Professor Julian Birkinshaw from the London Business School, he had a brilliant quote and he just said, use simplicity to fight complexity. He's right, of course, everybody working together in a single workplace with ease of use and an increasingly hands-free conversational way of working, either literally through voice interactions or figuratively through chatbot type interactions. That pairs the human workload with the software to the minimum, giving us the maximum time to spend on the real job. After all, being a successful procurement professional should not be about how well you can use software. The software should almost be using you, as it were. So this is why the user is so important in the success of, the, of transformation. And the procurement and IT leadership in cutting edge companies are really driving this agenda. We're all users, let's not forget that. Our expectations and opinions directly affect the usefulness of any technology in the workplace. User expectations directly drive assessment and adoption of a technology. 
and it's only through the use of that technology that it can have any impact at all and deliver a return on investment. And if we look at the most successful companies in the world today, the so-called FANGs, Facebook, Apple, Amazon, Netflix, and Google, their success is founded on positive user experience. The core mission of a technology future in procurement is leveraging the power of user engagement to drive better results. And as emerging technolo technologies make the user less of an administrator and more of a decision maker, we owe it to ourselves and the business to really think about how we can use technology more wisely in a more human fashion. So IT will need to be guided by the business users in this regard and be open to different ways of assessing the fit of any particular software into the business. The traditional means of evaluating software with a feature count checklist just doesn't work anymore. Complexity doesn't add capability anymore. Simplicity can do. So how do we go about removing the roadblocks in the real world? How can we realize the coming together of unified functionality, end user expectations, the need to keep on running a business and yet fundamentally transform it at the same time? How do IT and procurement achieve that together, removing the break in the system uh, and getting back to being able to have a, a good throughput, a good realization of the, of the business goals? Santosh, I think you've got uh, um, some interesting case study uh, information for us uh, in this session, so over to you. Thank you again, Paul. How many of us here have had a role model while growing up? It could be a singer, footballer, a teacher, or a professor, parent, or another significant member in the family. Look at yourself and you'll, re you'll realize that there are some traits within you that you've learned from someone else and that stick with you. I remember as an example set by a CXO at a company I interned while I was in college. He was there at, at my university uh, to interview folks and select them for internship. And of course I got selected there. <laughs> but what was interesting is that he, after the process was done, before he was about to leave, he packed up his bags, went around the room, and switched off all the lights. When I stepped in to complete the job for him and apologized for not doing it for him, his response was to treat every space you use like you treat your own home. I can connect that with one of the scouting principles as well, to leave a place as good or as better than how it was when we came in. We've grown up, but we continue to be heavily influenced. We continue to learn new things and imbibe those traits. Technology has made it much more easier to spread such influencing messages. Think of Facebook and WhatsApp and the video sharing capability that they have when a positive or a negative, unfortunately, message is spread around. It starts influencing people and brings about a tiny bit of change in how they're going to go about their day. We have seen technology change how kids play and talked until now about how we work. If the transformation is done from a user's perspective, organizations can also drive behavioral changes through digital transformation. But before I talk of behavioral changes, think about this. Does enforcement really work? And you can always pick a simple procurement-related example. Does no PO, no pay as a policy work? I was recently speaking to an ex-VP of IT who worked at a Midwest life sciences company for a good part of his life. His company managed to increase retention and drive productivity through a simple HR transformation, allow folks to wear casuals to work. What it caused was not just people showing up in office in t-shirts and jeans, it created an environment that was more relaxed and friendly and people started meeting more often to get things done rather than being formal and communicate over email. Digital transformation is not about software or tools. It is about the users using a combination of tools to do what they're supposed to do 
at a much higher productivity. It is about enforcing change without causing discomfort to the employees. There are two constants in this world, change and taxes, both something everyone wishes to avoid. There is a third construct which I'm not going to mention. So the focus of transformation should be to influence the behavior. Think of a simple procurement policy and no PO, no pay can be a simple policy when thought about from an end user's perspective. In true sense, the policy is daunting in its application, but if the process was simple for users and they see the benefits of doing it right, adoptions will, adoption will rise. It's not because people don't want to follow things that adoption is difficult. It's because the process that, and the tools that are at their disposal are not usually convenient. So the focus of these tools should be to drive automation and improve turnaround and throughput. But the truth is, only if the employees know how to use it will the adoption be high. This is where user experience becomes the key. And as an example and a case study, let's pick up the brick and mortar retail companies. Walk into any store, the store associates welcome you with a smile and offer to help you with your shopping experience. Their focus is to earn revenue by selling the merchandise. They need to rotate the merchandise as quickly as they can and make revenue. The staff needs to be lean enough and focused on interacting with customers, ensuring store visibility, and drive food falls. Not on purchasing indirect supplies, be it store visuals or lighting or toilet paper. And if you look at the typical workforce, this is a young workforce and are used to online shopping. So why can't their corporate buying be as simple as buying on an online store? If the store associates were to use the same equipment used for billing to quickly look up what they need, select the quantities, and say order, that achieves exactly what they're used to doing when shopping for themselves. What they are not aware of, and don't need to be honestly, is the part procurement, finance, and AI perform behind the scene about coding the expenses to the right cost centers, ensuring product pricing is as per negotiated rates and deriving the prices from contracts, etc. If the entire experience can be achieved in few screens, 10 or less screens, down to the point that no training would be needed, then the experience and adoption will take care of themselves. And this is particularly of value when the industry that you would be in is looking at high attrition. So you're achieving no PO, no pay as a policy without the need to even announce such a policy. This is far from being unique to retail. Most companies today, from oil and gas, looking to simplify purchasing for their employees on oil rigs, to financial firms, financial services firms, banks in particular, looking to simplify the process for their tellers, to specialized manufacturing firms, where their suppliers also happen to be their customers, and can influence their judgment on whether they're supplying to the right parties or not. So the focus here is on the user's experience. It does not matter at what position they are in, but the part of procurement should be as easy as buying things for their home from an online retailer. So companies today are basing their entire decisions on user experience. Paul? Absolutely right, absolutely right, and they should, because there is a conventional wisdom, which is that if you're in, a, uh, in an important job, a high-powered job, and you're using complex, difficult software, then that is part of your, the value that you have to the organization. You're the one in the know. You're the one who is able to, to use the software. That makes you more valuable. That is such an old-fashioned perspective. 
we have to be in a position to make the technology as easy to use for the expert as it is for the novice because then the expert can get on and do what they're expert in which is not using software it is being expert in looking for value expert in mitigating risk expert in negotiation expert in managing relationships both internally and externally and it's attendant upon the software industry to really understand this in a B2B context. Those B2C giants in the FANGS group have succeeded because they understand user experience drives adoption, drives uptake, drives revenue. The business to business software industry and their partners in the IT community within businesses themselves need to understand that just because it's easy to use it doesn't mean that it's not the thing that you should be using we need to break away from that old uh, kind of uh, attitude so procurement needs to find a route to productivity growth and new sources of value we've seen that the technology exists to make this possible but it's not a technology only fix people process and software will transform together and by working closely procurement and IT can build a digital workplace not just for sourcing and supply but for the entire business and the procurement and supply part of that needs to be integral yes technology will change the workplace uh, Dan Huttenlocker the Dean and uh, VP at Cornell University said in a recent interview with Goldman Sachs technology can destroy professions but it doesn't actually destroy jobs because new professions arise we see that all the time these days I mean people can make a handsome living posting videos on YouTube's of things being crushed in an hydraulic press or recorded in slow motion who would have ever thought that well maybe we are living in the end times I don't know but who knows what the future will bring perhaps we can all start to make some predictions it's been going on for years and indeed some of the predictions have been absolutely spot on this is one of my favorites last December saw the hundredth anniversary of the birth of the legendary science fiction writer and as it turns out accurate predictor of the modern world Arthur C Clarke in his 1953 novel childhood's end he had this to say about the impact of technology on the workplace when we think about how to design shape and plan procurement for the coming decades and when we think about what we ourselves might play as a role I think we could do worse than to bear his words in mind you'll appreciate that despite his foresight his vocabulary was still very 1950s I didn't paraphrase it I'm, I'm quoting verbatim um, so you'll forgive the, uh, the, the somewhat sexist uh, language um, he, he said the average working week was now about 20 hours but those 20 hours were no sinecure there was little work left of a routine mechanical nature men's minds were too valuable to waste on tasks that a few thousand transistors some photoelectric cells and a cubic meter of printed circuits could perform there were factories that ran for weeks without being visited by a single human being men were needed for troubleshooting for making decisions for planning new enterprises the robots did the rest the existence of so much leisure would have created tremendous problems a century before education had overcome most of these for a well stocked mind is safe from boredom change is inevitable we have an opportunity to collaborate and work together and drive that change in a positive creative and user human centric way that is after all what transformation in the workplace should be about to achieve this the process and subject experts in procurement and the technology and information experts in IT need to talk to each other understand each other and reach a common vision for the future in the end we can choose to follow one of two paths we can either side with Bert Lance who as an advisor to Jimmy Carter in the 1970s popularized the phrase if it ain't broke don't fix it or we could side with the great Grace Hopper pioneer of the software in the industry and true visionary who believed that the most dangerous phrase in the language is we've always done it that way thank you so much for uh, um, giving us your time and attention today everybody um, we're very welcome uh, welcome any questions that you have um, if you haven't submitted any to the Q&A channel please feel free to do so um, I know we've got a, a couple there um, left to uh, which we can answer in the uh, 
uh, in the next uh, 10 minutes or so. Um, what do we think? Um, Elise, have you got any that you can uh, uh, feed our way? Yeah, I got a few of them ready for you. Uh, so let's dive right in. This first question reads, uh, let's see, if the contract is so central to this, how easy do you think it is to persuade lawyers to give up contracts in document format? <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's a good question. Um, well, it's impossible. It's impossible. Um, and therefore, we shouldn't try. Um, and that, that may sound like a completely um, uh, contradicting uh, the point earlier about making the contract the, the heart of the, of the digital workplace. Um, it would be, I think, a fool's errand to try and um, uh, single-handedly move the entire uh, attorney industry, contract management industry away from creating documents in Word. What we need to do in a technological sense is effectively build a container around the document. Um, because for procurement to be successful, what is important to them is not so much the contract language, the terms and conditions, the wording, the clauses. What is important are those terms and conditions which affect the service levels and obviously the commodity information, the service information, the prices that are embedded in the commodity, so in, in the contract. So it's about extracting those in a straightforward and easy way at the point at which you're creating the contract in such a way that those elements, those data elements, informational parts can be connected in real time to the rest of the process. It still means that the contract document exists in a legally recognized fashion as a document, but it is not only that. We, you know, Santos will att attest to this. So often we see contracts coming out literally of filing cabinets and the question being raised by the CFO, CFO saying, why didn't we see the savings that were promised by this contract? And so the technology must exist to be able to run alongside the traditional route in some of these areas and to facilitate the flow of intent and information uh, and not have the document nature of the contract world act as that kind of uh, um, that that tree across the road. Um, Santosh, I don't know, I don't want to put you on the spot, but I don't know if there's anything else you want to uh, um, to throw in at this point in your experience of, of, of users of contract management. There is, there is, and you're right with involving legal team and getting their adoption to a contract tool itself, uh, Paul. What's What's interesting is there is a Gartner research. It's, it's a few years old now, but what's interesting is the findings from their research. A typical sourcing project ends with realizing, sorry, identifying about 11% in savings, but by the time the first year ends, the actual realization is less than 4%. And the typical reasons why it's lost is because the amount of time taken from the moment procurement team finalizes the supplier to the point a contract is put in place, you lose some time. And then once the contract is signed, no one is actively advertising the existence of the contract to the people who are buying from that supplier. Agreed. Excellent. Uh, all right. We actually have a couple of questions still coming through. Excellent. Uh, so let's move on to the next one. And let's see here. Oh, this one's a, a pretty lengthy one. Okay. So this reads, uh, do you have experience slash estimation on how much time would it take to convert a multi-billion worth of business based on inflexible and rigid platform to something that's more integrated? a uh, smooth and productive solution, just like what we heard in the past 15 minutes? Uh, yeah, that's, that is obviously a very good question. You know, what's it going to take? How long is it going to start? You know, what resources are, are required? I mean, that's, a, that's potentially another hour or more all of itself. Um, but it's not, a, it's not a quick and easy process to reach a kind of big bang, big bang trans, transition from um, traditional processes because it is about change management. Um, I think you know, it's, it can be years. 
um, to be honest, but it can be very quick in, in reaching some of the, um, the very rapid um, gains, the rapid productivity um, improvements um, by approaching it in the right way. Um, and uh, in, a, in a very, very brief nutshell in the time that we, that we have left, um, the first most important step is about understanding the status quo, getting a good vision of the as-is situation, both in terms of process, in terms of data, data ownership, data access, data locations and, uh, and systems and the, the criticality of all of that. And that gives a, a, a very good place to start in actually making this transition. Um, now, at, at GEP, we have a very clear model as to how to take a, a, a large multi-billion dollar organization through this process. I won't um, uh, try to elucidate that here. Um, it will be, come across as too much of a sales pitch, but we're very keen to, uh, to speak to anyone who has an interesting has an interest in, uh, in, in that approach. Um, it is most important, I think, to understand that it is not a technology fix. It is not about subscribing to or buying software and in, in expecting that to be the solution. It's about um, behavioral changes which can be facilitated by technology. It's about process changes which need to happen because we're moving away from old technology. But, and I think the a key um, position that procurement and IT leadership can take together is to be change leaders and not change managers. Really kind of own the space and really um, uh, determine what a brighter future could look like and, and, uh, and, and in some ways, uh, you know, to, to, to do um, what um, uh, what Homeland Security did in, in creating that kind of safe space for innovation, you know, breaking out of the, the kind of fear of what happens if we, if we change something and everything goes wrong, create a safe space environment to, uh, uh, to trial these ideas and, and put together um, a, a new way of working. Um, Santosh, do you have anything you want to add to that? I, I do, I do. All your points are very relevant, Paul. One particular aspect I'd like to stress out on is the as-is and the to-be state. It's not so much a process as-is. We are used to process maps and how and where uh, people need to interact with or what information they are going to interact with. What's also important is, from a transformation perspective, the behavioral changes. What is the as-is current behavior of the user groups that you're targeting to see the change? And where do you want them being a few months into the implementation, a few months after the implementation, and an eventual state that you want them to be reached? That, I think, is a better approach to identify which tools can help you get there, and also defines the timelines on how quickly you can get there. Excellent. At least Excellent. we can have one more. Very yep, yep. So let's see. Uh, this last question is a little bit lengthy as well. Let me just try to expand my screen. All right, so this question reads, how do you help the IT leadership understand what the current mode of just hiring APPS guys um, uh, hi. Sorry, let me start from the beginning. How do you help the IT leadership understand that the current mode of just hiring APPS guys is archaic? Um, business process analysts are becoming more important. Uh, where do you see the business process analysts reporting? Um, to the business or to the IT sector? Um, this is pretty much a struggle at the moment. Uh, everyone is quote unquote hardwired. Uh, any thoughts on this? Uh, yeah, everyone is hardwired, absolutely. Um, just <laughs> in the few seconds we have less left, um, uh, it is important to break away from just looking at, at apps, just just looking at um, uh, the, the, the software in isolation, not least because it's important for IT to remain relevant into the future within organizations. You know, there's a self-interest in IT not staying hardwired into the previous mode because 
um, you know, if you look at what we do in terms of software, it's all cloud native. It's all in the cloud. There is very, very little impact on IT infrastructure on the customer side. If there is, it's just about integration with existing ERP systems, which is a very straightforward process these days. For IT to remain relevant into the future, they need to get on board with what their customers are actually using and what they're actually needing to do. There is no application involved. Um, uh, as far as the, the, the business user, the procurement users are concerned because it's all there in the cloud. The IT people need to advise on best practices on how to actually integrate this within the multi-device environments that we're working in. Taking advantage of adjuncts like robotic process automation and chatbots, chatbots and voice interfaces, dealing with security, dealing with risk management. It's a new role for IT to play and if they don't do it quite fundamentally they will become irrelevant so I think you know that that's a, as good a motivator as any <laughs> Excellent. So I think we're, uh, so we're, we're probably oh, reach, reaching the end of our uh, of the patience of our audience now. So <laughs> yes, we have just approached the hour mark, uh, and I just want to leave our attendees with some final closing notes and just some wrap ups. Um, again, uh, last minute, very big shout out to our amazing speakers from GEP. Thank you so much for putting on such a lovely webcast. And again, thank you to our audience for joining us and attending this live session. We're going to be in touch shortly to follow up on the conversation. And if there's any additional questions that anyone might have, uh, we participate carrying on this conversation. Uh, we also have a short survey set up at the very end of today's webinar. So once I close out, that'll appear on your screen. Uh, feel free to leave any suggestions for future discussions, as well as let us know, you know how we did today. Also, this presentation will soon be available for on-demand viewing. I got a couple of questions coming through asking about that as well. And you will all be receiving that information to view the recording in about 24 hours. So make sure you keep an eye out for that. And while you wait to receive notice of that specific on-demand recording, uh, take a look at GEP's Knowledge Bank. Um, if you haven't heard of it yet, the Knowledge Bank is a central resource that shares all of their insights and thought leadership content within the community. So take a look at that. It's at GEP.com slash knowledge hyphen bank. And on behalf of GEP and the ProcureCon team here at Worldwide Business Research, I want to thank you all so much for attending, and I hope you all have a wonderful rest of your day. Thank you so much, and until next time.